Hi, this is Kevin Pulaski from Paradise Found Studio, and today we're going to be talking to Gwyneth Thompson Briggs. And she does amazing works, uh, some works in watercolor, in oil, even has a piece that was presented to the Pope. Okay, so really excited about this. So uh, let's get into it. So Gwyneth, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Gwyneth, we originally got acquainted uh, through the Catholic Artist Directory. Can you tell me more about this directory? I just founded this directory a few months ago because I felt like there was really a need uh, for connecting some of the, the best artists, Catholic artists living today with patrons that would like to commission their work. These are living artists that are accepting commissions that are working within the Western traditions of uh, sacred art. I see you started engineering and all of a sudden took a few years and then switched to art and then really hit that hard with a bachelor's, some follow-up courses. What's going on there? Very Leonardo-esque. You know, I was kind of wondering where you're going with that. I think maybe a bit of it was a, a lack of trust in God because um, I always loved art and knew that I wanted to be an artist, but I couldn't believe that there's any way that you could actually make a living as an artist. It turns out I don't enjoy engineering. So I retired after less than a year. I ended up teaching college level math for a number of years as I went back to pursue training uh, in fine arts. So I see a, a lot of variety, a lot of different styles in your artwork. Uh, you know, who do you feel are your major influences? I'd say for the last maybe five years, I've been really focused on the um, masters of the Spanish Baroque tradition. So artists like Velazquez and Zerberan are um, sort of my, my heroes at the moment. You know, going through your website, first thing that hit me was the fact that your painting was actually presented to Pope Benedict. Uh, now, how did that come about? I had done some work for a parish priest that I knew, and it turned out that he had an audience with the Pope. He wanted to give the Pope uh, just a small token. The problem was uh, he didn't contact me until about just a couple of weeks before. The painting was to be of St. Augustine, and I knew that I needed to have uh, a number of props to, to really realize this vision of how St. Augustine is normally depicted. This is a process that I use for all my paintings where I do my very best to try to find beautiful quality references. And so for this painting, I was able to borrow an Augustinian habit from a monk. Uh, I was able to actually contact the local archdiocese in their archives and borrow jeweled gloves and a miter. So I was able to incorporate all of those elements with a model. Now what's that in his hand? It's a depiction of a, a, a glowing heart. So we think about um, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Moving on to your St. Joseph painting. It's much younger than I'm used to seeing St. Joseph. Got his carpentry tools, but I'm not used to the imagery of uh, the flowers, with the, the lilies. Can you give us a little background on that? I broke from tradition in one way. The man I tried to depict was maybe in his 30s. So still the role of the older protector, but not a, a very old man. Um, I wanted to show his strength. And so uh, it was important for me to depict him as uh, a laborer. The model I ended up choosing was my older brother who does work, hard labor job, and it was just the perfect fit. The lilies that he's holding in his hand, it's actually flowering out of his staff. And the lilies depict um, his, his purity, but they also indicate um, the part of tradition that says, when they were looking for a, uh, a husband to espouse to Our Lady, um, the, the temple priest gathered all of the staffs of the young men, and it was St. Joseph's that blossomed forth into these lilies, and they knew that he was selected to be the spouse of Our Lady. One of the, the very interesting things about this painting, there was a man who looked at it who was deaf. He had been deaf his whole life, and he said, uh, the painting saying I love you and um, what I didn't realize is that the lilies um, actually look like in sign language um, a hand saying uh, I love you and so I had painted that completely by accident but um, um, yeah I was very very pleased uh, that that accident happened. Okay so moving on to the painting of the holy innocence um... Obviously, a, a lot of meaning behind this, a very moving subject, 
very important to uh, Roman Catholics uh, and Protestants. Uh, can you explain the, the background, the, the meaning behind this? Well, for a long time, I've really wanted to do something to help the pro-life movement. And um, especially now that I'm a mother, I, I just want to do anything to help people to um, realize the importance of these tiny lives that are oftentimes hidden from view. And so it seems like a wonderful uh, intercessor uh, would be the saints, the holy innocents. Um, these are tiny babies that um, were brutally massacred for our Lord. I really wanted to show them just after they had been martyred um, in their triumph. Um, and so I tried to show their bodies as beautiful and as transfigured and robed with radiant garments. And yet you can see that on the ground, there are these rivers of blood making a reality of, of their sacrifice. The, the child's expressions, a lot of dignity is what comes across to me. My daughter helped me with this one. She, uh, she served as the model. A baby that age isn't prone to sit, stand still. <laughs> so yeah. how, how was that experience? Well, you know, I try to I try not to work from photographs because I really believe in um, seeing the full range of light values from nature. And so, um, with with my daughter, what I did was I I had a sketchbook and I ran after her as she <laughs> was crawling around the studio and knocking things over. And um, so I had a number of small sketches to try to capture her gesture and her movement. To you emotionally on a topic like this, to uh, when you're talking about, um, you know, of course, you know, the death of, of babies and you're painting your own daughter. I mean, was that hard to do, to cut, to get the work done, cut through the emotion of it? What ended up actually hitting me a little bit more was after I had finished the painting and started to uh, promote the image and get the holy card out there for anyone that wanted it, that wanted to promote the pro-life cause, um, different mothers reached out to me and said that they had perhaps lost a child through a miscarriage or um, lost a child very young and um, there was something powerful that they connected to in that in that painting. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at uh, Our Lady of Sorrows. Okay, so this is a, an image of Mary and this, you know, her life of sorrows, depicting that, and which of course resonates with with a lot of people. And you know, the swords around her heart—that's that's pretty easy to interpret, I would guess. Um, can you take us through the history, symbology of this piece? I've always really loved the Spanish depictions of Our Lady of Sorrows, where um, oftentimes it's a statue where she's decorated with real human hair and lace and you can actually see uh, like crystal tears from glass eyes. I wanted to try to capture maybe just a little bit of that in this painting. I liked the idea also of using lace and specifically Spanish lace to create this idea of layers and I wanted to show the, again, the sort of the hidden nature of Mary's sorrows and that so many of these she's contemplating in, in her heart. And so you can see that her, her gaze is averted. It's almost as if we're looking through uh, layers of her veil. And so, uh, so some, in somehow to her, her inmost heart. Can you take us through your, your process of, of creating a piece like this? I selected a model uh, who I worked with uh, for a number of hours from life and I sewed a costume for her and found many Spanish lace mantillas. I have a collection. So I set up the model uh, and, and then just began painting. It's important for me whenever I paint, especially Mary or Christ or the saints to make my painting look like the model and then carry it a bit beyond. So you can see that this image of Our Lady doesn't look like a photograph, you know, and it doesn't look like maybe someone sitting next to you in the next pew in church. Um, instead, I tried to bring it into a level that you're peering at more of a meditation of, of what Mary might look like on this symbolic level. Now, along the same lines, uh, we've got uh, Our Lady of Fatima. Uh, were you 
designed a crown for this. And, and this is amazing work here. It's, uh, my understanding is a two inch tall crown. It's a small statue and you were asked to design just the crown. Really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this was a really unusual project. I had been um, approached to design uh, this crown for a statue and I didn't know the first thing about crowns because um, I don't have a lot of experience in metal smithing, but I started to research all the different possibilities of, of designing a crown from scratch or from having um, a computer scan an existing crown and then do 3D printing. And ultimately I found that the best solution was to try to construct a crown out of um, fine quality metals and then plate it to have a unified finished product. So, uh, so I was able to find a plating company um, who had all these interesting different odds and ends. And so we sort of compared different trims and then I built like a little model out of paper and together we collaborated to make uh, this crown. My favorite feature of this crown though is the little bird that's on top. And that dove is actually from a Torah scroll. I was thinking it, you know, it represents the Holy Ghost and there is a beautiful Portuguese tradition of um, Holy Ghost crowns to, uh, to honor Our Lady. Uh, just yesterday, you had sent me an, another image to talk about. It's the one that's right behind you. Beautiful image of, of St. Hugh of, of Lincoln. And as far as uh, iconography goes, you know, I'm always interested in all the different symbols. Some of them get pretty wild. And so here, you know, we've got, you know, a baby in a cup. We've got a goose. So can you take us through some of these symbols? Actually, you'll be surprised that the uh, the Christ child in the chalice isn't a symbol. This is, uh, there was actually a Eucharistic miracle. Um, the saint was uh, saying mass and uh, the Christ child appeared in the chalice. And so I'm just representing a historical event. <laughs> oh, you kidding me. So he, he's saying mass and he's, he's holding the chalice and then people see a baby the, ba the Christ child in the cup. Yes, yeah. Isn't that incredible? So St. Hugh of Lincoln was, uh, he was a medieval Carthusian monk that later became a bishop. The other thing that's uh, sort of unique about him was that he had a pet swan. And so uh, this pet swan, I guess, would go with him wherever, and it would even sleep on his pillow and kind of nestle its head in his sleeves. And the other monks did not like the swan because it would hiss at them. And the, uh, the Star of David? That was at the request of the patron, actually, because as a bishop, he was a wonderful protector of the Jews. One of the other sort of elements I incorporated into the painting was I have the index and thumb fingers touching as he holds the chalice. And that's exactly how uh, the priest holds the chalice during the mass, um, just after the, during the consecration. Um, so... I'm hoping that the gesture of the hand also indicate that the that the child is the the Christ child in the chalice. Gwyneth, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to discuss your wonderful artwork. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please subscribe. We're trying to build our subscriber base, and if you want to see more of Gwyneth's work, uh, her website's below, and my own website, Paradise Found Studios, below as well. So thanks.